Patrick Solinski is currently assigned to the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, Poland. He was nominated as one of the State Department's hometown, hometown diplomats for 2005 and as an official Foreign Service Institute mentor, the Foreign Service Institute being the place where Foreign Service officers are trained and prepared and, and retooled on their language and professional skills. His career and research interests include consular affairs, public diplomacy, international education, and career development for government employees. Previous to his commission as a Foreign Service Officer, he was employed as an academic career advisor in the University Advisement Center here at Brigham Young University, where he briefly occupied the position of International Student Academic Program Coordinator. I hope his title is, is now shorter. Um, he was also an adjunct member of the Linguistics Department faculty for several years. Um, Dr. Solinsky, uh, as we can call him here, I guess, earned his doctorate degree in Educational Leadership and Foundations at BYU in 2002. He and his wife, Alice uh, Alona, uh, have two children. Um, as I mentioned before, we are uh, always interested in, and uh, welcoming of Foreign Service officers who uh, are able to arrange their schedule to uh, visit us on campus. We know that there are many uh, LDS and BYU uh, graduates who are in the Foreign Service as a, as a, as a dynamic and exciting career. And we're very pleased to welcome uh, Mr. Solinsky here. Who, today he, his topic uh, for this lecture is the Consular Policy Tool, Insights into U.S.-Poland Relations. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Solinsky. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure to be back at uh, BYU. Um, one of the things I have to mention is uh, there are a lot of uh, graduates from U of U also in the Foreign Service, so that makes it fun. For Well, it has been fun for BYU lately, <laughs> but uh, it generally makes it fun to tease them as well. So um, I'm grateful to be here. Poland is a dynamic, a wonderful country. Um, it definitely has an interesting history. Um, personal level, uh, if you didn't tell by my last name, my grandfather actually immigrated from Poland, from Warsaw. as a small child. Um, I grew up in a Polish-American community um, when I was younger. Um, so I've uh, definitely been influenced in my life by my Polish heritage. Um, and then when I joined the Foreign Service, um, the fact that I spoke some Polish helped me get to go to Warsaw. So um, all of you interested in joining the Foreign Service um, as a possible career, one of the best advice I can give anyone is to really practice your foreign languages, um, really sharpen them up because the testing process is pretty, pretty rough. Um, it, just because you may have served a mission and, and have spoken a language for two years, if you're out of practice in someone, you may not get the same score that you were hoping to get. So if you're really interested in I think one of the best things you can do while you're at BYU is really sharpen your language skills. Um, it's an important tool, I, I mean, it's interesting to see the officers who have very good Polish and the opportunities that they're allotted as opposed to those who struggle a little bit with the language. And so just a little s insight on a personal level for those of you learning that. Um, I'll go ahead and read some from the thoughts that I jotted down. I did talk to my Consul General, um, Lisa Piasek, who's the Consul General in Warsaw, um, she's given numerous and numerous interviews and talks um, based on a very, in Central, e uh, Europe, um, Central and Eastern Europe, the issue of visas is, is just a huge issue. I mean, we just can't get away from it. We're an inundated um, by why can't these particular countries who have shown loyalty to the United States, who have, show, who have uh, overcome communism, have started fledgling democracies, why can't they just visit the United States without a visa? Isn't something wrong? We can, these countries can send troops to Iraq and those troops can be killed, but we can't enter the United States without a visa. Um, it may seem like maybe not that important of an issue, but when you work inside an embassy in the consular section, it is a, a burden um, to try to explain why this is the case and to try to explain the United States government policy that the visa waiver program is not a reward for loyalty. It is legislation, it is a program to increase tourism to the United States. It has criteria, set criteria that every applicant must, uh, every applicant country must meet in order for acceptance into the visa waiver program. And I'll talk more about that, but that's basically 
the problem that the biggest area of concern that we have in Poland right now in the consular section is how do we explain to the Poles who are clearly our allies why they are not allowed to just go to the United States like the French, like the German, and maybe others who haven't been very supportive of U.S. policy in the last few years. They're not required to interview for a visa, pay $100 um, in order to go to the United States. And so there's kind of a chain effect. Poland has, of course, kept its tradition of being a catalyst. <laughs> and so Poland has been the country in Eastern Central Europe that has really pushed on the United States for entrance into the visa waiver program. And since they've started that, there has been a chain reaction with the other countries who have joined NATO and the European Union or are hoping to join the European Union. They have followed along on Poland's coattails and are putting immense pressure as well on the United States to lift the visa requirement. So these are the Visegrad countries that you would assume that you're, we're talking Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, um, soon to be Bulgaria, um, the Baltic Republics, and so on. All of them are asking this question, when will we be allowed to visit the United States, our ally, without having to go through this visa process? So that's what I want to kind of explain, and then I want to open it up to you for some comments and questions that you have. And, and for this portion, if we can keep it on topic, um, on the uh, Poland issue, that would be great. I will be available at 3 o'clock to talk about careers, and I know um, that a lot of you have some questions about that. Um, as I said, a little bit about Poland. I don't know how many of you studied. Are there any Polish speakers here? I think I see a few of you. Look at those hands. It's great. Difficult language. Um, some of you have served missions, I'm assuming, in Poland. Poland is uh, a country that's a little bit smaller in size to the state of New Mexico, but has 38 million people in it. Now, Poland's demographics are showing that there's a population scare coming up for Poland within the next uh, years. Um, but at the time being, we still got a country about 38 million. We have about, it's difficult to document, but approximately five to 10 expatriates, five to 10 million expat Poles living within the United States, Canada, and different parts of Europe. That number is probably even higher. Um, because it's dif difficult to document all that. Um, unemployment rate of Poland has been traditionally the last few years between 18 and 20 percent. So if you have an unemployment rate of 18 to 20 percent, um, then you can see why consular officers might be a little bit weary to give people visas if they are currently unemployed or it looks like their prospects for employment and a stable life in Poland isn't very realistic. Um, and I'll explain basically what the consular officer has to do in just a few minutes uh, in order to make a decision of whether someone gets a visa or not. But in terms of becoming an international player, Poland's agricultural quality has made it a key player in the European Union. Um, Poland's currency has climbed against the dollar and the euro in the last few months and shows few signs of really slowing down terribly. So if you're living in Poland, actually, it's quite expensive now. A weaker dollar, a stronger zwolty, and um, my wife and I have been going to Walmart and all these places and buying up all this stuff because it's, it's, it's really expensive, and it's expensive for a diplomat to live there. You can imagine for the average Pole, um, we're talking Warsaw, that it's quite expensive to live in Poland right now. Um, again, another factor, the cost of living to, to live in Poland. Um, you may wonder if people think it's worth it um, when you're making a decision whether someone should be able to get a U.S. visa. You have to kind of put these things in perspective and say, do I think this person would return? Do they have enough ties to their country, to their employment, to their family, that they will actually go to the United States, visit, and come back? Okay, so we'll get to that question again. Um, in addition to uh, Poland's currency, um, the fact that it is really providing a lot of the produce for the new European Union, um, a lot of Polish products coming out. We've got dairy, we've got agriculture, um, and it's, it's good quality and it's low prices. So you have a lot of the European Union countries just, just grabbing up all this Polish produce and it's, it's driving the currency up. So uh, not exactly what the Poles really expected or wanted, uh, per se, but uh, the, the Zwolte is really strong against the dollar and the euro. 
Um, in addition to that, when you're talking about um, Polish labor force, it is the highest educated labor force in Europe. So Polish labor is also highly well educated. So when you have Poles going across the European Union to find employment, you've got um, employees who are well trained in their professions, whether it's uh, farming, agriculture, mechanics, engineering, any of the labor intensive kind of professions, Poles are highly trained. And so they're, they're also, they also at this point in time will accept salaries that are much lower than their European counterparts. So you have that issue to deal with. You have Poles that are, are trying to find, make a life in the European Union simply because we've got a country which they love, has a lot of history and ties to, but an 18 to 20 percent unemployment rate. And so what you have is a really interesting phenomenon where you have students, eternal students, because it's much easier to stay in school and get the first master's or the second master's, um, get a little stipend and stay in school, have something rather than try to go and get a job that you're not going to get. And so you have constantly well-educated uh, students, workers coming to your window with master's degrees and saying, you know, I want to go visit the United States. Well, a lot of them speak English. They also are highly educated. And they don't have a lot of reason to stay in Poland. So as a consular officer, you have to make that decision. Will this person come back, or, or are they going to go to the United States? Traditionally, in the United States, I am a product of Polish immigration to the United States, has an amazing Polish-American network. Uh, any of you familiar with uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, Buffalo, parts of Ohio, Indiana, can see really well-organized networks, um, Brooklyn, New York, Greenpoint, um, any of these places, you will see very well-organized networks of Polish-Americans. So when Poles go to the United States, they have something to go to. They have uh, automatic communities where they don't even have to speak English for the most part in the beginning. They can go right into the community. They can start working. They have friends, family who will find them jobs, who will give them places to live. And so you have a huge factor that hasn't occurred in the European Union yet. The Polish communities that exist in the European Union countries aren't near as established or strong. And so for the European Union to say, well, we don't mind if Poles come and, you know, and work and contribute and do those things, yes, because they're getting cheaper labor. And right now they're not complaining too much. But the United States does have to look at this issue by immigration laws. Will the Poles have something to really return back to? Or are they going to come and become a part of this community, these strong Polish communities, and just kind of take their place in those communities. I see it all the time. I see people come in, um, and um, they finally got caught. They went home, or something happened, and they finally got caught, and they had been in the United States for 10, 13 years, and never had a problem until then. No one had ever um, sent them home until that time. So uh, when people who are illegal get sent back, ordered removed, or voluntary departure. When they get sent back, they have to come to the embassy. We take their photo, we sign a paper, and we date it when they actually came back to their home country. I see this several times a week, people coming in and saying, I was there 13 years, I have family, I have a nice job, I have a nice house, um, and I'll find a way to get back. And so, I'm not trying to say that the United States wants to keep Poles out by any means. I'm trying to explain to you the difficulty. We have wonderful people who want to come to the United States, but in reality, we know that a lot of them will stay in the United States. <coughs> and uh, this brings us to the point that I wanted to talk about, the visa waiver program. Any of you heard of the visa waiver program? Do you know any of the countries who participate in that? You may be surprised. Anyone want to shout some out? Okay. Any other countries that you can think of that participate in the visa waiver program? Yeah. Any more? Right. Slovenia. Is that a surprise to you? Argentina, yes. And so here's another thing that we try to explain to our polls. You know, 
being a member of the visa waiver program, you have to keep these standards, these criteria, you have to keep them and you get audited every so few years. And if you're not meeting the standards, you're going to be asked to not participate in the program anymore. Argentina case in point. Um, again, another country with an unstable economy, high unemployment, and the refusal rate for their visas because of those two things started to go up. Now, visa waiver countries, in order to participate, what do you think that, what kind of refusal rate? And that what I mean by refusal rate is, when people come to the embassy and apply for a visa, the percentage of people that we actually turn down and say, no, you do not qualify for a visa. What do you think um, all the countries who participate in the visa waiver program, their refusal rate has to be in percentage? Does anyone know this one? It has to be 3%. 3%. I cannot tell you what Poland's refusal rate is, but I can tell you that about 75% of our applicants receive visas. Okay? Um, high refusal rate. It fluctuates, and that's why we're asked not to get into any numbers, because it does fluctuate. And uh, the polls like to really tie us down to a number, and you just can't do that because things change, but Poland has a very high refusal rate. That's the number one criteria, yes. Right. Exactly. Well, no, the, no. We're talking about people who need a visa, like Poles. In order just to visit the United States right now, they need a tourist visa. They still need, um, then again, you know, once they get in, that factor, but what happens is, you, s you start to see things develop in a country like Argentina, good case in point. So we, we know there's a high, um, so we would monitor it and figure it out what refusal rate we would probably be at based at this time, and then, you know, but there are other criteria that they weren't meeting as well. It's not just that one issue. Okay, all right, good question. Um, so Poland is saying, to the United States in a very interesting way. I don't know if any of you caught the last two visits of President Kwasniewski to the Oval Office. In a very, <laughs> which he promised to behave himself the second time. I was in a meeting when, uh, with uh, somebody, an assistant secretary at the State Department, and she had mentioned to me that I was, she said, I was right there, he promised to be sa behave himself. He would not ask President about visas again in the Oval Office. Anyone see the second interview? He did it again. <laughs> he cornered the president again on visas and said, Poland needs no visas. No visas for Poland, visa free. This is ridiculous. And so President Bush, because I don't know if you know how it works, when presidents meet together, there are only certain things, talking points they can talk about. And you can't use these, these uh, tactics <laughs> generally. But it's such an emotional issue for the Poles that Kwasniewski would have had a lot more problems in Poland when he returned if he had not done that. So he went again and said, President, what about visas again? Well, at least if we can't get visas, how about your uh, guest worker card visit? How about that? That program where you're going to allow people to get these little cards and sort of like border crossing cards and they can come across and they can work for a while and they can go back. Well, President Bush said, well, that's generally for another population. <laughs> We weren't really thinking about polls with that program. And so polls are thinking, well, that's not fair. We're higher educated labor. We can go over to the United States and we can just really do a great job. You can trust us. We're hardworking. We'll do a good job. Well, after President Kwasniewski misbehaved the second time and brought up the visa issues, something actually happened again. Both of his attempts have been successful. Uh, there is a great relationship between President Kwasniewski and President Bush, they do respect each other, they do listen to each other. Um, President Bush said, well, maybe we can drop some fee for student visas. And so when you're in the consular section and you're watching this, right, and you're hearing this, you're like, how are we gonna fund our program? I mean, how are we gonna do this? And so when the president was put on the spot like that, he said a few things and, and in terms of consular work, it's it's not really going to work immediately like that. We're going to do everything we can to, of course, fulfill the president's wishes, but um, it's a little more complicated than that, than just creating a guest worker program or just allowing Poles to enter the United States without a visa. 
One of the interesting things that has happened is the Polish Amer American communities have great lobbyists, and they have great friends in the Senate and the House. They have several Polish influential Polish Americans in the Senate in the House who are trying to push visa waiver for Poland by attaching it to bills. And so basically, this attempt has happened twice, and it has failed twice. But there have been attempts to simply stick pulling in on legislation as part of the visa waiver program. And so that hasn't happened yet. We have a wonderful Secretary of State, Dr. Rice, right now who is working hard with the polls. We have a wonderful relationship with the polls. They have stood by us. They have stood by the United States more than any other ally in, in Europe, I have to say, besides Great Britain. And uh, President Bush also had talked about, within the context of talking to President Kwasniewski, that the United States has no greater ally than the Poles. Well, the Brits weren't exactly happy about that comment, but you know, when you put it in, in context, it's, it's true in many respects that the Poles have been very supportive of the United States. They love the United States, and they, they're taking this policy towards them very personally and very emotionally. I can't go anywhere to any parties, any type of activities um, where I'm mingling with people without, and when polls find out where I work, they just get me. You know, why not? Why can't this? You know, why can't we go to the United States? Well, we go back to the issue of the strong Polish American communities, the automatic network that's set up. Ooh, we've got high unemployment. We've got s research that shows us. We did a research. We did a survey la about two months ago. We asked young people, college age students, in Poland, um, if you're able to get to the United States, either legitimately or illegitimately. If you're able to get to the United States, how many of you would come back? Sixty-six percent said they would not come back. Okay, and that was research done by the Poles and the Americans. And so, when you're looking at those figures. You know, uh, it pains me at some times. Well, I, I actually do sometimes I do some visa interviews. Not a lot, but I do some visa interviews. And, you know, you look at the person and, and you look at the criteria and you wonder, you've got about two minutes, actually, in reality, to make a decision, if that, whether this person is, is, has enough ties, enough reason. They're going to come back to the United States. You've got, about, you've got to take their finger scans. You've got to look at their picture. You've got to look at... Have they been involved in any crimes or anything in the computer? And you're talking to them in Polish and asking them, where are you going? Who are you staying with? Where do you work? Have you had any previous travel? Where have you been? Have you been in the United States before? Uh, what's your purpose of travel? Um, you're married, but your husband's not going with you, and you want to stay for five months? You know, there's things like this that the people don't understand. Uh, being a consular officer is a lot of hard work. We don't simply just look at a person and in five seconds make a decision. Um, we have to ask a few questions, and then sometimes two minutes or so is not enough. You've got to make the decision, and you have to move on to the next applicant. We do about 700 to 900 tourist visas a day in Warsaw. So you can imagine that's a quite a load. Um, we have about uh, 10 consular officers who do nothing but visas all day long. Um, and so we have this issue. We have a wonderful Secretary of State who's meeting constantly with the polls and saying, OK, the visa waiver program is not realistic for you at this time. But why don't we sit down as friends and allies and develop a roadmap? Um, Hungary, Czech Republic, and so forth had also received roadmaps from Secretary Rice of what their nations would need to do in order to meet the criteria for the visa waiver program. Um, I just can't stress enough. If has I, have any of you been in Poland recently, maybe within the last six months or, or even a year, anybody? Has this come up at all the the visa issue? Even for you, you don't work at the embassy, but someone has said, "Why can't we get visas?" It's it's everywhere. It's in every newspaper. It's it's the topic of everything because the polls have taken this to be a slap in the face. And what we're saying to them, no, it is not a slap in the face. We cannot reward loyalty to the United States with this program, which is legislated by law, not to do that. And no matter how many times we tell them they believe that they can załatwić something, and in Polish they say this all the time, they say, you know, you can make it happen, you know, that somehow you can make this happen for us and we can, we can get in. 
But you have to appreciate the tenacity of the polls. They have not stopped at this issue, and we have road maps in line. We have more discussions about what could we do as the United States to help our loyal allies in Central Eastern Europe to prepare themselves to actually have visa-free travel one day to the United States. That's the goal that we're all looking to help them accomplish. But under current legislation, we simply can't wave a magic wand that doesn't exist and allow Poland to sneak in under the bar when they are not meeting any of the criteria. Yes? Do you know what, what are some of the elements of that uh, road map? Yes. The road map is to basically look at the criteria for each visa waiver program entry. So we've got visa, the first thing we have in some of the criteria, visitor visa refusal rate for nationals for a country must average less than 3% for the previous fiscal year. Then there are additional criteria regarding this program, passport security and handling procedures, political and economic stability, border controls, <laughs> law enforcement cooperation, and security concerns. Now Poland, of course, feels that they're, they've got everything knocked out except <laughs> the refusal rate. And they're constantly asking us for numbers so that they can take their statisticians and show that our calculations were incorrect. Um, but uh, I can tell you just from working on the visa line that uh, quite a few people get refused each day. Okay? And rightly so, based on the criteria. Um, polls are interesting because in my experience it's been is, is they, they're fairly very honest and candid at the interview window. Um, they will tell you that they haven't been working for a while. They will tell you that they only make this amount and that they have some cousins in Chicago and that's where they're going to stay and see what happens. And uh, then, you know, and often they're not surprised when we, we, we do refuse them. Um, so it's an issue that everybody's becoming more educated about, both the Poles and I think the United States and Americans. The one thing that I will say that Americans who do not live in Poland, I don't think that most Americans understand that Poles cannot come to the United States without a visa. Because we get so many calls in American Citizen Services each day. Why do they need a visa? Poland is it's like a normal country, you know. That <laughs> what's a, what do they need a visa for? And so we explain this to them. Um, Poland has done some wonderful things um, in terms of being accepted into NATO. This is another issue. A lot of people in Europe equivalent membership in NATO as um, membership in the visa waiver program. And uh, so the media propagates this idea and constantly Polish media will simply say, if we're in NATO, why can't we be in the visa waiver program? And so you have Poles not quite understanding it. Then you have the cost of a visa. How much do you think it costs to go and apply just to make an application and, and go in an interview with a consular officer to see if you qualify for a visa? $100. Is this a lot of money for some people? If it's a lot of money for those people, do you think they should be applying for a visa to the United States? I hate to be crude about it, but if, it, if that $100 is a, extremely a lot of money, for them. Are they going to have the necessary savings, the money to spend to actually go and do tourism in the United States? I'm just talking like a consular officer now. These are things you have to think about when you're at the window. If they're constantly reminding you that they had to pay that hundred dollars and it took them three months to save it, then, then you have to question you know, what their motives are about going to the United States. Are they really going for tourism purposes? And that's a, that's a hard thing. There's a question in the back. extremely realistic because they have a, they've been there themselves or they have a cousin or a brother or someone in those communities I talked about who's constantly telling them about it. Oh, the newspapers, the Polish-American publications, I mean, uh, Dr. Whipple is here, he's an expert on the air, on Poland. He could tell you that it's, 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 it's amazing. Um, when you go to these communities, in, uh, if you leave the subway in New York and you go out to Greenpoint, and you get out of the subway and you know you're in Greenpoint, you probably don't hear English anymore for a while. It's all Polish. 
Everything is, is written, all the signs, the newspapers, you get Politica, you get Gazeta. I mean, you feel like you're back in Poland. And so because of that, of these really well-established communities where the language is intact, where there's lots of programs, lots of people there immigrating, they know. They know. Whether they've been there or not, they do know. They have a good idea of what it's like. And a lot of them think it's still better than Poland. Here's the interesting thing. A lot of Poles will tell you, well, we don't want to really live in the United States. We love Poland. I mean, it has such a history. It's our land. Um, we're connected to it. We would just prefer to be able to live and work in the United States for six months, save money, and then come back to Poland. Well, what's wrong with that? That's not in accordance with immigration law. And so what we have to do is, is to do that. And, I mean, it sounds like a great idea, right? But, uh, and sometimes when you're talking to these people, it even sounds kind of logical. But you have to look at immigration law from the State Department and from the Department of Homeland Security. You have to look at the Immigration Naturalization Act and look and see all the stipulations. If you've ever seen this, any of you looked at the INA? Oh, man, it's a beast. And we are constantly going through there and trying to understand it ourselves and trying to give the polls the right information about why they don't qualify for visa. One more comment right here, Dr. Whipple. No, I think that that's true for many of the polls that I've spoken with, too, that they have these expectations um, of what the United States will be like. Clearly, any immigrant who immigrates has these expectations in their, in their head of what things will be like, whether they pan out um, the way they envision them. It's a diff maybe a different story. Um, but they do believe that things have got to be better in the United States, right? Yes, question. If you had an 18 to 20 percent employment rate, wouldn't you like to get it that down on somebody else's back? This is kind of a, a, a really direct thing to say, but that's how many politicians in, in, in Washington view it, that if we let Poland into the visa waiver program, of course the Polish government's not going to be too unhappy about that because we're going to be able to allow people to go over and work in the United States, then our unemployment rate is going to go down and things are going to be better in Poland. That may be too simplistic, but that's, that's an idea that a lot of people think about. Um, yes? Difficult to gauge, but I, w I, would, I would say that it's quite a bit. I mean, Poles are very, very committed to their families. Um, I mean, besides probably Latter-day Saints, I haven't met another group of people who keep such good connection with their cousins. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, they really, really are very close with their families. Um, so that's just been my observation. I, I could be wrong on that. Question in the back, and then we'll go over here. My experience, and I have worked in the immigration visa section, has been that Poles mostly marry Polish Americans. Um, and so you don't have this phenomenon where you have um, people, you know, looking on the internet per se for Belarusian brides. You don't really have that phenomenon happening in Poland where you have Americans simply looking to bring Polish brides back at this point in time. We don't see that, at least in terms of the immigration. What we see is 
people who had connections, they met each other, they used to live in Poland, then they went to the United States, they immigrated legally, and now they've come back and they still knew each other and they got married and they're going back to Chicago. That happens every day. And that's legitimate and good immigration. Yes? Not with the polls. Um, to the extent that that happens, you would probably want to contact DHS down actually at the Mexican border because uh, actually where that happens illegally is that poles get to Mexico and then there is some trafficking through Mexico and also in Canada. Um, but it's not, our statistics show us that it's not near as high as with other groups of people. Yes? I don't think it's a question of we don't want them here. It's a question about how, how do they get here with under which program. And so one of the things we're trying to do with the State Department is to encourage Poles to seek programs of legal immigration to the United States. So work visas, new non-traditional work programs. Um, you can get different visas to the United States. And then when you get here on legitimate work visas, you can tra change those visas to resident status legally. And that's what we're pushing. Is that difficult to do? Yes. Does it take a lot of time and effort and money? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any real numbers on that. Um, DHS has those numbers. Um, and then they fluctuate so much. Um, I, I simply don't have those numbers. But we do, we do know that it's a high rate of overstays, I can tell you. An overstay means that you enter the United States on a visa a tourist visa, you have six months to return to your country or to get extensions. If you don't do that, you're considered an overstay. Poland has a high, high overstay. Yes? I know that um, certain Not yet. Yeah. They're building. They're the yes. Exactly. You know, we answer that, we, we look at that question every day based on, we have a program called the J, Work and Travel Visa, it's the J Visa. And so you have students who qualify and then they go over um, for a few months and, and they work. And when we looked at, at that point with uh, overstays and um, how many would go over, we also looked at the dollar falling. And we looked at our data from last year where we had a certain amount of thousands of participants in the J program. And we thought that this year with the dollar falling, that the people who would normally go into the J program and go over to the United States for a few months in the summer would simply say, that's not very smart for me. I'll just go off to England or Ireland. But we didn't find that happening. We didn't find that happening this year. In fact, we found lulls in our numbers. We found periods where we didn't have as many applicants. And then all of a sudden, we'd hit a point where it brought us back just about equal. And so. Again, polls are looking also at, at those opportunities to work on the J visa as an opportunity to make money. And so if it's in their interest to make money, they're going to do it. They also want to work on their English. They also want to meet, see their relatives that are living there. There are lots of reasons to do the J program. We've got about five minutes, so we'll just take a, a couple more questions, and we'll let you guys get back to, to class. Uh, I hope don't mind if we just answer some more questions. Yeah. No. Not yet. <laughs> um, no, that's, no. So we got uh, any American citizen on a U.S., a valid U.S. passport can travel to the United, to Poland visa-free and stay for 90 days. Okay. Yes? This is a broader question, but it seems to me self-defeating recently in terms of uh, our uh, national security that we are uh, restricting the number of students coming to the country. They're forced to go somewhere else. That in time is going to be, I say, self-defeating in terms of our future. Right. Right, the question of student visas, the amount of student visas, uh, students studying in the United States from different countries has drastically dropped. Uh, a lot of those students are, are going different places to study besides the United States. It's a huge concern. It's a huge concern for Secretary Rice. 
She has an education background herself. It's one of her um, issues that she's, she's handling 100% to try to get that number increased. When we get feedback um, from polls, for example, why they're not studying in the United States, well, they can study for fairly good education, in their opinion. Some would argue better in Poland or in other parts of Europe without having to pay the exuberant costs that are required in the United States. Cost is clearly an issue. Uh, educational costs in the United States are very, very high for Europeans at this point. Okay. One more question. We've got two, two more questions here. Okay. Well, definitely it's had some, some, some conflicts, but uh, I would say that it's paid off quite nicely for the Poles. Um, they've stuck to their guns. Uh, they've not turned their back on Iraq. Uh, again, there are plenty of Poles who are not particularly happy that po Polish soldiers were in Iraq as well. Uh, but at the same time, um, this loyal support to the United States, I think, is paying off in many ways. Uh, we can see that simply by the concessions that are being made, the roadmaps, the programs, um, the ideas that are going out there to try to make our close ally, the Poles, happy with what, how we treat them. And uh, so I would say it's paid off quite nicely for them. I, I think Poles would argue that, that maybe they should have aligned themselves. Some Poles would argue that maybe they should have aligned themselves with maybe Germany or France uh, more than with the United States. But I haven't really felt that Poland has been, has really uh, taken any big hits with their alliance to the United States. Not at all. The Europeans, again, are, are happy to take Polish products and Polish, pol Polish labors. So there's not a lot of complaints. Any time for one more question or comment uh, regarding um, this? I'll, I'll kind of wrap up then in just a, a, sen uh, just in a, a few, uh, few words about it's an extremely emotional issue for us as consular officers. Um, generally, Poles are, are great people. They're the type of people we would want to have in the United States, just as many people from many countries are. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that this issue has come to um, a head the way it has, but hopefully with the visa working groups that we have, with the roadmaps that have been discussed by uh, Secretary Rice, with the greater collaboration we have with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with the President of Poland, I think that we will eventually one day um, reach a point where um, there may be more programs available to Poland. I, I will not say at this time that I think Poland will enter the visa waiver program anytime soon. The Poles are always throwing the year 2007 around and that, that's to me just not very realistic. Um, but a valued ally in NATO, in Iraq, historically, Kaszczuszko, Pulaski, we have a, a very emotional relationship with the Poles. They love the United States. Uh, generally, Americans love the Poles. And so I hope that will continue in the future. Thank you very much.